Welcome, everybody, to QF2, quite frankly, a podcast not about Howard Stern. I'm your host for this one, Phil Moore, and with me is Kayla. How are you doing, my dear? I'm good. How are you doing? Not very bad at all. And actually, I'm really excited to try this uh, episode. We're tackling the Murdoch trial, but we're going to try to come at it from a different angle altogether. And first, before we get started, I just want to say this is all speculation. We're doing this for entertainment. We're not lawyers. It's just our opinions. We don't have any uh, inside uh, knowledge aside from our gut, basically. And we're doing this for entertainment purposes. We hope you guys enjoy it and don't take it too seriously. We're just trying to you know, shoot the shit around about something that is uh, quite a hot topic these days. Now, um, the first thing is, before you've you've said just now you said I'm not watching the case. You purposely decided not to. Why? Because when I first found this story or first watched, I don't even remember what it was that I watched, but it was like an hour um, kind of in depth um, overview of the story, kind of like a 2020 type deal or whatever a year ago, and I was just so fascinated with it because as everyone probably knows, I'm from Georgia and I'm from the South. And so, you know, meeting connection. And when you hear the people talk, I'm like, wait, wait. <laughs> so I got kind of hooked on it a little bit. And so now, so like as you're watching and everything, you get kind of all these opinions and ideas of, of what's going on. And so I don't want the trial to sway my original opinions. And so I kind of just want to be surprised at the end as to what really comes out about everything. Mm -hmm. I can't say I'm as virginal with the case because I am <laughs> following episodes. I'm using the Law and Crime uh, channel, but like, oh, I think, like I think most people are. I'm waiting for each day to finish, and then they somehow clip just the testimony of so-and-so, and they get rid of all the people waiting in line for, you know, like, <laughs> oh, look, here's here comes uh, Mr. Murdoch. Or, and the other thing is, guys, I don't know if it's Alec, Alex, Murdoch, Murdoch, uh, and I've looked it up, and it, they do pronounce it Murdoch. Like mm -hmm. Matt Murdoch, Daredevil, but they it's spelled Murdoch, and I I have no idea how that happened. I I mean, is it some kind of I don't know. I, I don't know how that happens. I do know that, for example, by my family, not my family, my my in laws um, near my in laws hometown. There's a a family called their family name is uh, Devereaux, but mm -hmm. like the friend that you know, it's which could be but a Blanche. Uh, it could, yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> but they, they they literally pronounce it Devrix. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Um, there's something to that um, because I went to school with a guy and his last name, it was spelled Daughtry, right? But he said it Daugherty, which is yeah. just kind of like the Murdoch, you know, pronunciation. There's something what? to that. So I, I suppose it's just a regional thing, and and it would be, um, it, it's just it it depends on where you are and 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 what the, mm -hmm. what what they grew up with. I mean, Alec, Alex, we all know, like if you you know you know the cleanser Ajax, is mm -hmm. it all of a sudden Ajax because this guy's <laughs> name is it Jif or Gif? I have no idea. I don't know. So the the first thing we're going to give you guys is our our gut feelings prior to uh, any kind of serious. Depth. We're going to go into this documentary by HBO Max called Low Country. It's called uh, The Murdoch Dynasty. And it's a three episode documentary that precedes the trial itself. They, uh, Alex has been um, uh, indicted on uh, the murder charges, of course, but it it's not colored by all the other bits of information. We really wanted to go in the lay of how this all happened, the murder of Stephen Smith, uh, the Mallory Beach incident, uh, her her death, the cover-ups, what these people are like, and more of the psychological um, avenue of what made these people the way they are and how does it get to this point. Because it's irrelevant if he gets convicted of the murders or not. He's doing time. We know that. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, I, was th I thought it would be more fun and more entertaining to just look at the psychological aspects of the case as well. So what was your gut feeling based on just just the, the these three episodes, for example? I mean, so when you say gut feeling, like why, what happened, is that 
Not your gut feelings. Of, yeah, yeah. The you're basically your your theory on what went down. Basically, what mm. do you without? And this is this is where we become. Um, this is where <laughs> we become dickheads after the fact, guys. If if our predictions turn out to be nonsense, you know. So from the south, you if you are especially kind of in the professional world, um, you will come across what people refer to as good old boys. Well, what that means in kind of the professional world is kind of like, you know, that grandpa started the firm, uh, the dad, the son, the grandson, they all work, they, you know, all work together and um, you can do no wrong. And they all look out for each other. There's like a whole network of them. And the, the thing about them, too, is they come from old money. Most mm -hmm. cases, it's like mm -hmm. family money from years back. Um and there is just this little network of you take care of me, I'll take care of you. And it's it's almost kind of like a secret society in a way. Mm -hmm. It's really mm -hmm. interesting um, to observe. So my thoughts is that um, Alex, I guess, um, is kind of the last remaining uh, good old boy of this family, mm -hmm. of the line. And he just couldn't handle it. whatever happened to him he just started spiraling and spiraling and spiraling until he just lost it he couldn't recover from all the shit that he had done okay so when you say spiraling let's go let's start with the financial stuff for example because i'm fascinated with this he's gone on to say he had an opiate addiction he went to quote unquote rehab which i believe is bullshit I believe he 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 did he does take uh, painkillers or opioids. I believe he might have a bit of an addiction. No addiction is going to cost ten million dollars of of, <laughs> of fraud in ten years. There's no addiction costs that much money. My question to you would be, what could have required that much money in that area with that many properties that I had to imagine some of which came from his ancestors? Exactly. That is literally the question that I wrote down. Okay. Where is that money going? Right. So it's, my, my, it's, the, my theory was, of course, what, what, what costs money in any, in any lifestyle? Okay. Vacations, sure. We don't know the, all the ins and outs of that. Um, big cars, like those Escalades and shit like that. I mean, it's mm -hmm. not, I'm sure it's no cheaper, not much cheaper in South Carolina than it is in, I don't know, uh, Illinois for these cars. Right. Uh, boats, uh, the boat that was crashed, it wasn't a massive, massive, like fucking, uh, Putin yacht, you know, like in the, in the, in the Monte Carlo or something. Um, it was still something most people don't have. The average person doesn't have a boat. Mm -hmm. Um, multiple properties. Okay, fine. At like skiing vacations, lots of guns. Guns aren't cheap, obviously. And they, they, it looks like it was, you know, something out of Terminator 2, the way they explain how many guns they had. <laughs> and, uh, and so, and of course, the kids went to private schools. They were trying mm -hmm. to get Paul into um, a private college, I suppose. Um, like, and he's a lawyer, but he's not the town solicitor. He's a voluntary solicitor, which means it, in 2005, they abolished the system in which basically it kept getting, you know, pardon the expression, grandfathered into the Murdoch family. So I don't know if with that came less money. He's working for the firm. They prorate, th they prorate things on the work you did, but it, you don't see a lot of the money until the end of the year. That's the way it was explained. Right. And so, but, you know, even with them, so say he was making less money, mm -hmm. he had to have had money given to him, inheritances and things from that family. Certainly. Um, and all, you know, and that town only has like a population of 2,600. Yeah. Under 3,000. Right. So even his home and, you know, his thousand acres property or whatever couldn't have costed that much so you know say he was making a poor man's 100k you right know, like here right. yeah right? no i get it like there he was stealing millions for years he was yes. taking money like where was it going no right. 
pill addiction is going to be that much. No, way. no. So, so my, my, this was what I had to, this is what I wrote down gambling, which makes perfect sense. Yeah. That's where a lot of stuff goes. Gambling. Uh, if there were mistresses in that town, they probably wouldn't have, again, cost what they would cost in New York City. <laughs> right. You know, I took her to the bowling alley and she, you know, I got, <laughs> you know, I, sorry guys, I don't mean to make this, you know, this, I'm trying not trying to sound, uh, you know, make cast dispersions on the accent. Um, the uh, uh, drug dealing, perhaps trafficking. Yes, that would be expensive. But you're you're presumably presumably making money on trafficking if that's what you're spending it on. Right. Right. Payoffs to local law enforcement. Yes, that does cost money. But again, does it cost what it would cost in New Jersey uh, for or New York cops or you know fucking L.A. cops to look the other way? Um, now, more recently, obviously, it's lawsuits that he has to pay for. But what about ten years ago? What was the co- what was the big you know o- uh, what do you call it uh, um, overhead that they needed millions? Right, and even with the payoffs, it wasn't just from him. The whole family was doing it. So, um, I really kind of go to gambling. <laughs> Possibly, he was in one of those big, you know, big Dan Belvarian situations where you pay, you know, 100K, 200K to sit in on a round. I don't know. That's the only thing that makes sense to me, because mm-hmm. unless he wasn't that successful. Now, what, what you know, the dynasty, it goes back to his Alex's grandfather, mm-hmm. uh, who, you know, it was, you know, we're talking about the in the depression uh, in the year of the era of the depression uh, and made a big he was a big wig. That and he was a town solicitor. Then his uh, fa- his grandfather. So his, sorry, his grandfather. Then his father. And then sorry, let me see if I got this right. Great grandfather, grandfather, father. Then him. And with that, uh, like I said, with that position no longer being a a set thing, maybe he's getting less money that he should. Maybe Maggie's got some champagne tastes. Maybe she needs a little too much bling. I have no idea. Um, the and and then the fact that when listening to the Mur- Murdoch Mysteries, the podcast which we're using for, I'm, I'm using for extra information, guys. But I'm and I'm going to actually direct you to the podcast. It's wonderful, except for the first episode where the, the host has a bit of vocal fry, but she gets rid of that. She works on it and she does really well. So I have to credit them. From what she explained, sources explained to her that Maggie had uh, like fifty six bucks in her checking account when she passed away. Hmm. OK, um, mm-hmm. she was embarrassed because Buster or Paul used her credit card uh, a couple weeks earlier and it was declined. Somewhere mm-hmm. for like 50 mm-hmm. bucks, you know what I mean? Like the small, like petty cash amounts. If they were doing that poorly for that long, what in the f- like the, the lawsuits? OK, yeah, that makes more sense. It makes more sense that he'd need immediate money over since the boat crash. But that's not that long ago. No, it wasn't. Um, what? The boat crash was in 2019. Boat crash was so, in 2019. The Stephen Smith killing the uh, the poor kid that uh, was mm-hmm. found dead in the road. of uh, yeah. An obvious not hit and run, as you guys will see when we get to that episode. Um, that didn't require any kind of payoff that I know about. Mm-hmm. And they're they're not paying lawyer fees if they're lawyering up for each other. <laughs> Exactly. Right. Yeah. So, so possibly, you know, he just started that domino effect of years ago, mm-hmm. living outside of his means. He kind of looked like a loose cannon from the start. He really reminded me of like that typical 80s pokehead kind of guy. Um, that's what he really reminded me of. Um, mm-hmm. but the Southern version of that. Yeah. And so possibly he just got in over his head from the very beginning and just was sh- just kept going, treading water, treading water, and then got into something else and then just started sinking and could never recover. Yeah, I'd say it was a snowball effect and uh, trying to keep up, not keep beyond, not keep up with the Joneses, maintain a certain distance from the Joneses. And that costs money. And if you're not bringing in as much billing as you normally should because you're lazy He doesn't, they talk about how he was a brilliant lawyer, but one of the recent, uh, one of the, um, uh, one of his, one of the people working at his uh, firm, 
before they shit canned him said he was master a master in the art of bullshit. Right. That doesn't take right. that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a skill, a people skill, but mm-hmm. it doesn't necessarily make you a better um it doesn't necessarily make you a more proactive worker. Right. And you know, as I was like watching and digging around in some of this stuff too, I was like, well, I wonder how many cases he actually even tried. Because he he really comes off as just like a little rich kid. Fuck he off. La- we does. They all seem like lazy shits. Yeah, they do. They do. Yeah. So maybe the whole family was living off great grandpa's, you know, <laughs> nest egg from way back. <laughs> yeah. And they all yeah. ruined it. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. The, the impression I got was they're all, and, and this, from what I understood, Paul was a uh, bona fide shithead. Paul oh. Murdoch, you know, I, I know guys say, people say, well, he didn't deserve to die. I'm not talking about deserving to die. I'm talking about maybe a little karmic retribution from all the nasty stuff the family has been has been associated with. And I'll list it, guys. First of all, we talked about Stephen Smith, the, the death, the roadside death of Stephen Smith, which more than more than likely looks like he's the victim of getting a baseball bat to the head. Yeah. Um, there's the Mallory Beach incident, which basically it's DUI manslaughter. But on a boat, I don't mm-hmm. think there's any. I don't think there's a difference between if it was in a helicopter and it happened, or on a fucking skateboard. <laughs> you know. No, he got he got charged with DUI. Yes, and mm-hmm. but they didn't they didn't give him a breathalyzer at the right. scene, which just mm-hmm. goes to show you what pull yep. the family had at that time. And this is 2019, so Mallory Beach death, and then of course the injuries of the other kids on the boat. Um, then. You've got the housekeeper in 2018 who accidentally falls down the stairs after a dog jumps up at her, completely dubious, and Alex has stolen that money to the tune of Mm -hmm. $4.3 something like that, insurance. Uh, Do you know a lot of people that have life insurance policies on their nannies? Right. And what was interesting, I don't know if you want to get into this now, but what was interesting about that is at her funeral, Mm -hmm. Alex approaches her kids and yes. says, it's it's my fault. It's liability on my land. Um, you should file an insurance claim on my insurance policy and basically sue me. And I'll yes. hook you up with someone that will sue me. Yeah. And then, so it was a complete tax scam. And yep. then, uh, sorry, insurance scam, not just did fraud, basically. <laughs> and then what... What happens later, of course, with the uh, um, Alex, the Eddie Smith uh, uh, fake suicide or attempted suicide, it was by Alex Murdoch's admission, complete bullshit to get $10 million in insurance money on his own life to give to Buster, which I, I presume would be untouchable. I guess the, 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 the insurance would be ironclad. It, he wouldn't get, I don't know if he'd get uh, taxed on insurance, Buster, but um, that would be no, some don't. kind of, le- that would be a legacy for his son, basically. Right. But do we really think this son with 10 million would <laughs> let that burn a hole in his pocket? Yeah. See, there's something about that whole story that doesn't need to be there. I don't know that I fully believe Any of what? Well, first of all, I don't believe anything that he says, but. (laughs) Okay, sure. Now, this particular story, there's something off with it, too. It just doesn't. No. Okay, so let's go. Let's let's put our cards on the table so we can look like geniuses after or complete (laughs) assholes afterwards. Uh, Alex Murdoch, guilty or innocent of these two murders? Guilty. Me too. Okay. Um, and, and guys, we understand about the, the reasonable doubt and the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the difference between direct evidence and circumstantial evidence. But the truth is most cases are won with circumstantial evidence. You don't necessarily have to have the murder weapon or the blood clothes, the bloodstained clothing, if, you, if, if the theory doesn't make sense any other way. Like if he's the only person that could have killed them, if he was the only person in the premises and they have timestamps essentially of where phones went off, this and that and the other thing, a jury just needs to believe that that person could have done it. Right. As exactly. well as they may not have. So it's a, it's a more like a percentage thing in, in my opinion. Um, mm-hmm. Now, the reasons for killing them, financial mm. or something we read about just very recently. You know – I don't think it is financial. 
Okay. Actually, so we're so you want to maybe save that for a, we'll table that mm-hmm. for another discussion in another episode because yes. that's the psychological aspect we want to right. discuss. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, any questions on your part that uh, things that you're not on the, the money was the one thing, anything else that you still would like to discuss before we go into the clip? Um, not really. I think whatever is still hanging out there will get brought up as we watch. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. So guys, we're going to go, we'll go with this clip and it's, uh, from the low country miniseries on HBO max. First, you're going to hear from a writer, uh, Mark Etheridge. Nobody ever had any reason to leave that part of South Carolina, and nobody ever had any reason to come to that part of South Carolina. Small towns generate big fish in small pools. Okay, now this is Joe McCullough. He ended up being Connor Cook's attorney uh, with the Mallory Beach case. But has long uh, he has a long association with the uh, with the town and actually knew Buster Murdoch, the uh, the grandfather. Um, and, and so he has a great anecdote that I've clipped that'll come in later on from CNN when him with him and a round table of attorneys discussed. And it's a great, great quote. Did you manage to mm-hmm. see that one? Oh, oh yeah. <laughs> brutal. It, it was, it was a eerie. Yeah, it yeah. sure was. Hampton is pretty much historically dominated by one family. Okay, this is a uh, just uh, it's called. This is another lawyer from Bamberg. He's literally his name after the county, Justin Bamberg. Uh, he represented. And this is a county north of Hampton, where all this is happening, and he represented um, a bunch of other people in um, civil suits. Uh, over the years. And so he's, I think he's there just as a correspondent more to, um, uh, more to uh, just add a little more color to the whole region and explain a little more about the Murdochs as a dynasty. The Murdochs. Murdoch. That name means power. They're a great American family who has a successful Law firm had deep roots in their community. Money, position, power. The Murdochs have had control of Hampton County for close to a century. They have held the position of the prosecutor, the solicitor, we call it, through four generations. Everyone knows that they are the lawyers in the area. Okay, that's Henry Humans Jr. He's a, a low county resident, and uh, some of the previous people. There's another lawyer there. I forget his name offhand, but either way, they're establishing that this is a dynasty. This is a mafia family, more or less. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I wanted to say, I wanted to say this earlier that this, yeah. um, that position, um, has been ran by the Murdoch family for eighty-seven years. The longest family ran prosecutor, whatever it's called, in U.S. history. So they have owned this town for, what, 90 years, pretty much? And, and I believe, if I'm not mistaken, the the job did not just stop at their county, but the five surrounding counties as well. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's that's a fiefdom. Yeah. 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 Imagine one family having that much dominance in your Yep. And in a situation like that, it's not hard to imagine that sense of entitlement coming through the line and then by extension to Maggie, who um, from from what I what I've listened to and what I've read, she was not necessarily a bad person, but definitely hoity toity. And she enjoyed the lifestyle, which Mm -hmm. I guess makes her guilty of the sin of, uh, you know, greed, I suppose. Uh, right. And avarice, but again, I don't know if she deserved to be killed. What is clearly understood is none of them had any boundaries. <laughs> she got off right. on the power just as much as the kids did, and the kids were not um, disciplined in the slightest, clearly. No, no. The Murdochs are the justice system, kings of uh, the Low Country. The investigation into their murders was extremely closed. Authorities were being very tight-lipped about what... Okay, this is Pilar Melendez. She uh, writes for The Daily Beast, and she had a lot of good things to say as well. 
evidence they had gathered, how exactly they even had died. It was all very shrouded in mystery. While a Murdoch family owned hundreds of acres in this area, the people who are their neighbors wouldn't talk much about the family or exactly what happened, just saying that they were good people. When the murders happened, the town stopped talking completely. It was truly this sort of ghost town feel of, we can't say anything about it because either we're scared or we know too much or we could be next. Okay, so Andrew Davis, he features prominently in the documentary as well. Uh, and why he's not afraid to talk about it is because he has a forum. He's a reporter. You cannot just off a reporter, although maybe <laughs> 50 years ago that was more likely to happen with some of the older brand, the older clan. Mm-hmm. My opinion, you couldn't ask for a better childhood than him in a small town. You know, that's not what a lot of people like, but... I wouldn't have it any other way. Anthony Cook features, of course, he um, he was Mallory Beach's boyfriend, and he was on the boat that night. And what you're going to hear, guys, before long is him talking idyllically about Paul Murdoch. I wanted to get your feeling. Did you get the sense of someone who's just um, too afraid to be brutally honest, except when he was on camera with the CCTV, not CCTV, <laughs> the dash cam, being right. fully honest after the accident? Right. Is it a matter of like conflicting emotions? I'm not quite sure how he can ta talk about Paul and say he was a great guy. That's what I didn't understand with the, you know. I don't think this is the same guy from the uh, police dash cam. I think the police dash cam is Connor. I, I can't. Well, Connor, Connor had broken. I think he'd broken his jaw or injured mm -hmm. his jaw. I'm pretty sure mm -hmm. it's Anthony. At oh, the time. OK. okay. Uh, but but right. Connor, Connor definitely would have been um, one <laughs> to say, like, uh -huh. <laughs> fuck this guy. <laughs> He's just an ass. Yeah. And, and there's a segment. You guys are going to see it. There's a segment of the video in which. Paul and I believe I may be Connor, but I think it might be Connor. The two of them walking towards the boat on the dock and three of the others back, including Mallory, like behind them as if to as if to illustrate their reticence to get on the fucking thing. Mm -hmm. And it's it's often in these in these dash cams and these CCTV things that it, it's more illuminating because you can't you're, you, you don't if you don't know the cameras there. You don't know to act for it. Right. So uh, I think yeah. it, it, with him, I, I'm not sure, exactly sure why he, ha he has this take when I'm sure his parents would think very differently about the fucking Murdochs. Exactly. And not, you know, and also to say that they all knew he was a fucking asshole, especially when he drank. So he, he was even more of an asshole then. They all knew it. And exactly. So, you know, I don't know... You know, to your question, I don't know with this one. I don't yeah. know. I don't know. He, a, he probably is a little scared. Yeah. Um, he probably has a lot of guilt about what happened because he didn't step in and sit and do anything. Um, mm -hmm. He didn't step in and say, let's not get on this. He didn't challenge him. Or what yep. um, so he's probably just probably feeling a lot of different things at the same time. I think that's a fair assessment. Me and Paul, we started hanging out. Probably when I was in fifth or sixth grade, couldn't ask for, you know, a better friend. A very South Carolina group of friends that would do a lot of outdoor activities together. In the low country, you go fishing and you go boating. And sometimes those activities may involve a little bit of uh, alcohol consumption as well. And I, I, listen, I'm not going to eat people's lunch for that. Yes, I grew up. We we all drinking was a rite of passage. There's no question. Um, I right. get that. That that's on all walks of life for the most part. Um, we'll continue, guys. This is more of the um, CCTV footage from gas stations, the the um, Parker's um, convenience store where uh, and the gas bar where Paul buys booze with his brother's card. You've seen the two brothers. They mm -hmm. look like they could be related, but they certainly don't look exactly alike. No. And if you're in a small town like that, whoever the cashier was is going to know who he is. Absolutely. So that He's wasn't a case of them making – that wasn't them making a mistake or not doing their job. That was – they saw Murdoch and said, okay. Right. 
this is just how, I mean, that's just how it was. And I think that is a good example of just how it was. Mm -hmm. He did whatever he wanted and nobody said anything because they didn't want the room clash if they did. But I mean, in this particular case, let's just for for example, you're a cashier at a at a gas bar. If you say no, is he are they going to drive somewhere else to get it? Yeah, most likely. And if they mm -hmm. give it to someone else, that is, and so the thing is, uh, what I don't understand, this kid, this stupid idiot, could have had his brother get the booze for him, which is what we used to do. <laughs> get someone of age right. to order it. There's no crime being committed. Yeah, his brother is interesting. Um, and actually a question that I had and not to get off on this is why was Buster spared in all of this? There's something <laughs> yeah. about him. He either just was silent behind the scenes or he just wasn't this big, loud something. There was just something about him. So I, I wouldn't put it past him just not wanting to deal with it and being involved with Paul. So mm -hmm. he just gave it to him because it was easier. Most likely, and Buster was, by all accounts, the favorite child. Mm -hmm. um, from the Murdoch Mysteries, they go into detail about Maggie and, and the kids and what they were like growing up. And again, it's, it's opinions may vary. Your mileage may vary. But the consensus was um, Maggie had postpartum depression after she gave birth to Paul, which may have led to a sort of in, in, indirectly. I don't know that this all, always happens, but when women get this, it may there may be some ill feeling towards the child that caused, like, let's say, caused mm -hmm. it because it, you associate the birth with that horrible time. You may feel less than maternal towards that kid, regardless of if they're good kids or not. And that's going to affect the relationship growing up as well. Mm -hmm. Think of this younger kid. The baby's usually favorite. In almost right. every family, they get like a special privilege, the oldest and the baby. It's the middle ones that have some <laughs> issues often, their own specific issues. And so if you know that the older kid is the favorite, but you're the baby, you're going to cre that's creating a monster. Absolutely. And also, you know, the thing with babies and the family, too, is that they, they do get to do whatever they want and no responsibility because everyone kind of dotes on them and. And babies them, right? And so sure. it was probably just all of that mixed together. It just yeah. created a monster. Mm -hmm. And we're going to go, there's an article, guys, from, I believe it's the Wall Street Journal that I'm going to start reading a little bit about uh, after we get through some of this footage. So just hold, hang on tight. <laughs> So provisions were made by some of these kids to get beer and to get alcohol. Paul Murdoch. Okay, so I'm looking here. Looks like a 12-pack or some – it's more than a six-pack of oh, light yeah. beer, I suppose. Um, some bottles, probably like hard lemonade or whatever that stuff is, mm -hmm. you know, like cool coolers or whatnot. Those are – proper drinks and then something else maybe more wine coolers or something but it's it's a fair amount of booze mm -hmm. for you know it's at least three drinks a piece yeah I think he used his older brother's id he walked out and then lifted the 12 packs up over his head in celebration They went in the Murdoch boat, and they've they're already bringing their own booze. It's BYOB, and someone's being bringing much more YOB uh, mm. than the rest of them because, well, he's hosting it. I guess he's got a truck and he can take the most. But um, I, from from all accounts, again, he was a holy terror when he got boozed up, and he was known around town. They called him Timmy. That mm -hmm. was the that was the alter ego. Now, if you drink so much that Someone calls you by another name, like this is you, mm -hmm. you change that drastically. I think he, there's more. That's that's an indication that you have some kind of alcohol problem. Oh, absolutely. That you're you're basically drinking every time to where you just lose all um, consciousness, and you you really do kind of become this whole other person. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's funny with um, like people who drink. You know, 
most people go one of two ways usually, right? Like they Mm -hmm. either will get super happy and like, oh, they love everyone. Or, you know, sometimes a a girl, you might get a little cry, you know, towards the end when you get sleepy. But then there's other people that are just angry and want to fight, you know, when they drink too much. Yeah, it's asshole juice. I found that when I yeah. drink whiskey, for example, I could get either really, uh, t- usually I could get pretty belligerent, but or just sar- sarcastic more than belligerent, I would say. But on other alcohol, no, maybe sad once in a while, whatever. With whiskey, it could go either way. But with other things, yeah. it was pretty, you could, it wasn't too, too difficult to figure out how the night would go. Um, but I was looking into at one point, because we're going to go into it, they would, they explained his fingers got s- got spread apart when he got too effed up and when he was clearly drunk and they couldn't, he couldn't bring them together. It's almost like some kind of weird alcoholic neuropathy. That's interesting. I missed that. I haven't seen that anywhere. I looked up some of the, some of the, the technical terms and one of the re- causes for stuff like this is brain damage. Ooh. And if he was drinking a daily drinker, The way they explained it, like hitting it hard all the time, Mm -hmm. it wouldn't surprise me if he did have some some mental problems as a result of it and physical problems. Also, that would be one of those things. But I've never known anybody that had that happen as as a result of drinking. Mm -mm, Me either. Not that I know of anyway. No, I've seen loads of people sleep on bar tops, but not uh, (laughs) (laughs) dancing on the yard in a ditch. But no kidding. Exactly and headed towards a destiny that they could not possibly have imagined. Just take us through how y'all met up that night what and what y'all did. We want you to tell us what you're sure mm-hmm. and certain about what you saw. Mm-hmm. Okay. So we were over at a friend's house. We left from Chichassi, which is Paul's house, in his boat. Everybody was drinking. Ain't no nine at high enough. It was just the thrill of going on a long boat ride at night. Then for some reason, Paul and Connor decided they wanted to make a pit stop at a bar on the way in. I definitely knew that wasn't a good idea. Just looking at Paul gesticulating like a kid who owns the candy store. Mm-hmm. Like a kid yep. who dad, whose dad owns the candy store, we can do whatever the fuck we want. I know, guys, yep. you're going to think, well, guys, it's it's all perception and you're you're biased. And yes, I'll, I'll be honest. I'm one of those people like I think most of the most of the public watching this is the underdog. They are the 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 have nots. I'm not saying I'm a have not, but we we always want to see the rich dickheads get their comeuppance. Who doesn't mm-hmm. love to see uh, justice be served where it becomes mm-hmm. a class struggle? Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and the again, with the, the documented uh Evidence so far based on, you know, his his peers growing up, they they all said he was a bit of a, a holy terror. And this is just more of it, really. Now, in this, I just want to ask you this on a on a personal level in your stupidest kid moments, like as a teen, like when we all started drinking, would you have ever gotten on a boat knowing that everybody else was getting screwed up? You know, I would love to say that, no, I wouldn't. Okay. But I can't. I mean, if I'm being perfectly honest, I don't know. It's a little different for me because I don't like boats anyway. They creep me out um, Mm -hmm. real bad. And like that video was just, oh, grossing me out so bad. Um, But I've certainly been in cars with people that I should not have been driving with or riding with. Yeah. So it's kind of the same thing. They probably, they were all used to a boat. So it's kind of like a car for them, you know? Right. Um, I might have, honestly. And if yeah. I was drinking too, you're, you're not making the best judgments when you're drinking always anyway. Yeah, not necessarily. It's true. And I know I for sure one time at least that I can recall 
getting behind the wheel of a car when I shouldn't have and mm-hmm. not, not being, not being super fucked up and, and by in the slightest, but had I crashed into something or hit someone, I would have probably failed, uh, an alcohol yeah. exam and, um, and would have been screwed, would have lost my license, mm-hmm. would have had charges filed against me. And rightfully so, because you have to have that, it, it, you know, you, like you said, when you're young, you don't make the best decisions. Mm-hmm. Um, however, they have a history with this kid. Do you think it's more a fear of what he's going to do if they don't? Now that is, see, that's another side to it too. And it's so layered with all of this stuff, right? Like mm-hmm. they come up with them, they're friends with them. They're also used to this. Yeah. As annoying as it is and how much he gets on their nerves, they still hang out with him. Yeah. So, that's the one thing I can't understand. Like, why wouldn't you drop this kid? Like, why wouldn't you just not hang around with him? Peer pressure? I just think Murdoch pressure. everything. It might be some of that. It's just what you're used to. If I you guess. don't know any different, you know, yeah. I mean, they're young. They, oh, I don't know. There's just so many layers to it. And it's so much deeper than like surface level stuff, you know? Well, yeah. It also might be a little of, um, he is an asshole, but he has. We get to party at his parents' such and such estate every now and then, which we don't have that access mm-hmm. with other friends. Like yeah, they've got money, it's nice to have a friend with money. It could be just on that surface level. Mm-hmm. It yeah. could be that they all just hang out and have fun, and you know, drink and get to have parties and do crazy stuff. And you know, when you're a teenager, eighteen, nineteen, that's pretty appealing. So yes. Yeah, that, you don't have a car, but they've got several. I mm-hmm. mean, that's a, and if you can get a bit off of that, well, wonderful. It's great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It's like the kid with the soccer ball. <laughs> you might, you might have to play with him. At first, like we didn't want to go, but Paul was like a little drunk and he wanted to go. And this girlfriend Morgan, they kind of like got into it, fighting about it, and you know he just was very persistent about going up to Luther's and getting a shot. He's like very persistent. Whenever he wants to do something, he's gonna do it. I, I tried to stop that from happening, but there wasn't much I could say. Paul was like the puppet master. People listened to him because of who his dad was. People were afraid of him because of who his dad was. It wasn't anything too good that I've ever heard about him that people would say. They would say Paul was very arrogant, entitled always got his way i'm trying to think who has a more punchable face than this fucking paul kid oh god my nose was like crinkling up the minute his <laughs> gross little face was coming up oh my god he's such a shit well this is what this is what i i've said from for years you can't fake likability and I mean, you can you can fake it actually. If you're if you're a celebrity, you can always put it on because people don't see you all the time. They just see you on you know TV and whatnot. But in real life, most people with a gut can sense if you're a good person or not. They can also see it in your interactions with other people. That's how we determine who our friends are for a lot, a lot of the a lot of the time. This kid looks yeah. not just an asshole. He looks evil to me. He does do you do you get that impression? Yes. Like there's some Look malevolence. Yes. He uh, through, is. Like <laughs> looking at Busters, I see the wind whistling through his ears. I just see right. it. Yeah, I, I look <laughs> just for just just from physical features. Buster doesn't look like he graduated top of the Dean's list, is all I'm saying. No, no. And but Alex is no different. Alex also looks like he wasn't a Rhodes Scholar. No, it was like Goober. Such a goof. Like he's just going like a giant toddler doing tantrums, you know, like ugh, gross. <laughs> like a wind up, like a wind up doll or something. Like just kind of th- he slams into the wall, doesn't realize it's doing it. I don't know. Anyway, these are uh, uh, other people that live near or know the family. The guys just you can, if you want, just reverse the video <laughs> for, the, for the names. Mm. Like if we get if we get the if we don't if the video doesn't make it to YouTube, um, just. Uh, just trust us when we say they're friends of they're in the community. They know uh, they're peers of uh, Paul and, and and Buster, obviously. You could tell he was a rich kid. He had a temper and he liked to control everybody. And if you didn't do what he wanted, he had friends that would back him up to do his dirty work. 
He always did a few things that I had. And I don't really feel comfortable. I'm not going to talk bad about him. You know? Why not? Fuck. No. Oh, my Lord. And what does that mean? He has friend. He had friends that would make you do what you want, what he wanted. What does that right. mean? Because that I ties more it. into like the uh, the Stephen the Stephen Smith uh, death. Yes, that- yes. And to that, when we get to it, I don't think it had anything to do with Mister. I think it had something to do with this team. I agree, and uh, not being mm-hmm. however old he was at the time, like a lot younger, maybe I don't know, because mm-hmm. he was he was how old when he when he died? Twenty two. So he would have been 15 years old. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's it's I very don't possible. We'll, I have, don't. we'll have to, we'll, we'll cross that, pardon the expression, guys, but we will cross mm-hmm. that. We will drive into that bridge when we come into it. So um, here we go. He was a good guy. And we grew up with Paul's family. We um, did. One thing that we have tried to instill in our children is you're friends with the murders, but at the same time, you have to be aware of them. Because if something goes down, you're going to be the one in trouble, not them. A lot of people in town would not let their kids hang out with Paul because of the reputation they all have. His mother, Maggie, she taught her children, do whatever you want to do, it's okay because of who you are. They raised them to know that they were above anyone else. The law did not pertain to them. It's a scary thought because you know they have that much power. Now, okay, these are two couples. This is Connor's parents, and this is um, Anthony's parents talking about, uh, obviously, the the, uh, the Murdochs. But, and yes, you could say they're biased, but I, I'm, I will say this. At the end of the episode, they allow Anthony, I don't know why, but they give him the footage to say, he apologized. He came up to me. He 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 knew he had done wrong. This, that, and the other thing. However, um, uh, so they're trying to uh, they're trying to at least offer some kind of balanced approach to this. Mm-hmm. And I I think they were being more than fair. I think at the end of the day that they're probably just good people and had a hard time leaving it on a bad note or like leaving it to where they were just trashing the. Kids. Because he got murdered, <laughs> you know, like. Yeah, because you, at this time, when the, when this uh, document, when this uh, series is made, um, keep in mind, guys, uh, we don't know the full extent of the fraud, although I'm sure in that town they all knew, mm-hmm. if you know what I mean. Um, they knew these were expediters of <laughs> purveyors of really awful behavior, um, getting away with literally murder in, in some cases. And uh, and as I said, that clip will start playing soon. But also, you're right. Like, we don't know. Was it Alex? Was it a vigilante? Was it a gang that he, he forgot to pay off? Like, the, my my head, one of the theories I thought was Colombians. What do Colombian drug dealers, drug gangs do? They go after your family first, and then they kill, they kill you. They, they want their money back. They're presuming they yeah. need to leave you. It's like a leg breaker. If they want to collect on... Um, uh, a debt. They don't want to kill you. They'll just break your kneecaps and <laughs> make you suffer until you pay them back. They want their money back. But um, I don't. In this case, there's just uh, anyway. We'll go. That, that's that's going too far into it. But bottom line is, um, they they there's not a lot of room to consider that extra bit of oh they're vigilantes you mean they waited two years to get revenge and they shot paul and his mother i don't i don't buy it no i don't either no i don't think it had anything to do with this at all and i don't i don't think anyone thinks that well Uh, there's there are people that want to float the idea out there but i don't i just don't buy it it seems less it seems way too far-fetched it does it really does mike hemlip justin bamberg joe mccullough and Eric Bland are all local litigators. All four of you graduated from the University of South Carolina School of Law, correct? Yes. Because Alex Murdoch also graduated from the same school. Randy and I graduated together. His brother. Um, yes, his brother. Growing up, the Murdochs, even over in Bamberg County, you know, people knew who they, who they were. 
Randy, I, I, I have stories I'll tell you. Now, I was talking to a lawyer here in town who said his old law partner, who was a big political figure here in town, got a call one day from old Buster. Buster is the nickname of Alex Murdoch's grandfather, a solicitor who served for 46 years. And Buster said, Counselor, I know you can uh, help me out here. My boy's gotten into some trouble and uh, needs to be gotten out of it. And I know you can handle it. And so the lawyer jumped right on it. And within an hour, he'd made the calls like we could do in the good old days and make problems go away. And he called Buster back and he said, Solicitor, I got it taken care of. It's all gone. He said, well, what do I owe you? He said, Solicitor, I don't need to be paid. I, you know, this is a favor. And, and he said, Buster then said to him, well, you know, Counselor, if you ever need to kill a man, you bring him to Hampton County. And, and whether that was true or false, maybe a joke, that was the reputation, and that is what that community has dealt with for decades. The, so for obvious reasons, mm-hmm. guys, you know why I included that clip. I just talked it up maybe a little too much. I believe it 100%. We do too. I and believe it And I don't believe for said. a second. I don't believe that it was meant as a joke at all. No, no. Now, he may have said it in that coy kind of way, but mm-hmm. no, it was serious. It was serious. And that is such a good representation of that evil self. You know, that evil rich. <laughs> the old boy network. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Not well, their level, but yeah, yeah. Well, the, the only way that power works is if you control every leg of the process from the uh, the state, like the the sheriff's department, the uh, what do you call them? The uh, the state troopers, let's say, the litigators in town. If you have if you have inside knowledge, but and, and this is also part of the whole narcissistic complex guys like if you're a a true npd or you know we use we throw that term around too much if you listen to qf you know our regular show you'll know we focus on howard howard's covert npd quite a lot um but one of the things that's most important to these people is control and with alex i don't know exactly like his his need to control may be ruined a couple of these things for him to the point where he couldn't help himself anymore. Yeah. And that brings up a good point too, that I was thinking about what, so he's the loose cannon and you have to imagine that the rest of the family that, you know, that's, that's are well-maintained at least from the outside, mm-hmm. they have to be going, what the fuck is up with this guy? Somebody's got to reel him in. Somebody has got to get him under control. Mm -hmm. Or did they just turn their back on it and was like, let him fend for himself. I'm not going to worry about it. I'm going on, you know, my vacation. End of story. Because they had to have known for a while that he was losing his shit. You mean Paul or or, or, or Alex? Well, I'm going to Alex right now, but, you know, yeah. Well, it's it's it, the thing is with those with these NPD or these nar- well, I'll say narcissists with these narcissists, you you often they're, they're like hence the reason why Maggie wouldn't know all the finances. Now that's not uncommon in a lot of families. The one parent, usually the father, deals with all the finances and blah blah blah, and the, the mother just doesn't ask questions. Not so much anymore, I'd imagine, because you know, working mothers, Christ, they they've got to have some input because they're they're contributing, obviously, and so are, I mean, not that stay at home mothers aren't contributing guys you get what i mean but like really money coming in right uh, actual money so in this situation um like he he needed also to maintain that the lie of being so affluent and the the people are they're trying too hard to come up with a motive when he literally could have just snapped like he's got a financial thing that's coming down the pike. Like Maggie's going to find out. There's a lawsuit that's going to be filed. Or sorry, there's a trial for Paul that was due that week. The week they were the week they mm-hmm. were shot. The week they were killed. He was due to stand trial. That's weighing on his mind. Uh, mm-hmm. Maggie maybe needs to see the finances because of that. Because because he said we can't pay. We can't pay the civil suit, in Mallory Beach. Um. In his mind, he's thinking, I, I can't afford this lawsuit. Mm-hmm. I can't afford to settle. 
Um, Maggie's going to find out my Paul, my boy, Paul is a fuck up and he's not my favorite son anyway. So mm-hmm. I'm just going to fucking shoot them and may and blame it on someone else. The same yeah, way I was attacked. I, I got attacked by someone. Oh mm-hmm. no, it's a fake suicide. If you'll do one, how far is it a step to do the other? Right. And by this point, they've had already allegedly, uh, the housekeeper had already died mm-hmm. and, I feel very confident that Maggie knew what was going on at that yes. time. Oh, yes. I feel she knew and she was in on it and she went along with it. And so could have been, too, that maybe Maggie was starting to cry. Maybe Maggie he, was responsible for the fall. That's what that's what I was thinking, because she would have been all in. But if she was all in, then the financial thing kind of falls apart because how would she not know that she doesn't have enough money in her account later on, like year where like the year yeah. of the, the shooting the mm-hmm. you know, um, I, unless it was one of those things where you handle the business. I don't want to hear about it, but you take care of business, uh, Alex. I don't want to know about it. So don't involve me in this. Um, I'm more apt to believe that, that it was, maybe it was an accident. Maybe it mm-hmm. wasn't, but it's very suspect that, they're able to collect on it. And be, truth be told, I know families that have abused, you know, they, they can walk fine, but they will go around in public in a wheelchair. Sure. Of course. You know, yeah. it's, 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 right. it's in, you know, it's, it's not that difficult a thing mm-hmm. to scam the government in some cases, uh, in Greece, in the old country, my God, I knew, I knew families that claimed, um, not, not I, I knew, I heard of stories of families that claimed the loved one was still alive and they were collecting friggin' old age checks and they died years before. Yeah, you hear about that quite a bit, actually, <laughs> of the, the social security checks coming in, mm-hmm. still getting cash, and they had been dead for years. So, yeah, there's definitely fraud out there. Yeah. And I just, you know, Alex was losing his mind. Honestly, I feel like he had just gotten in so deep, he could not get on end of story. And it, it had just come to the end of the line. And it would have been, he thought maybe she would tell everything that she knew. Um, or he could have just been trying to wipe the slate clean because he was so stressed and like, just couldn't deal with anything anymore. And I was like, let me just get rid of everybody. And I won't have to deal with this shit. (laughs) Right. I know we make it sound like an extra sketch, like you just kind of shake it and everything gets reset, but it's not like people seem to think, oh, you know, there has to be an A, which leads to B, which leads to C. There's a certain amount of that in this case, I'm certain, but it could have very well been one of those things where he snapped Mm -hmm. and the way it's positioned, the way the case is positioned just from the, before they went into the trial, Paul's body's here. Maggie's body's quite a bit away, uh, like 30 feet away. I think something like that. Uh, I'm not, I'm not sure of the exact, I know the layout where the uh, kennels were and and where the, the bodies were found. It would, it would presuppose that, and, and the aut- autopsy is revealed. Connor is shot first. Okay, he's there's two guns. There's a shotgun and an AR-15 or whatever version of the assault rifle. It's and Maggie, a, sh- what, what's that? Isn't it called like a black something? Like blackout. A, yeah, yeah, that's it. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. I'm not a gun guy generally. I mean, I, <laughs> my knowledge obviously. of guns is limited. It's it's it's, it's as limited as my knowledge of, uh, you know, I don't know Montreal Canadiens roster in 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 1957. I I just I know only so much, but uh, Paul's shot with a two shot shotgun, I presume. Um, and so that makes perfect sense. Are you going to reload that shotgun or do you have another gun on hand mm-hmm. to shoot the wife after she sees it? But it would suggest that – and his arms were down by his um, – down by his, uh, his, his sides more or less. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't – there were no defensive wounds. He didn't go, oh my god, what are you doing? That kind of thing. Mm-hmm. It, 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 it's, it sounds like he was comfortable with who he was around. He was. Right. Exactly. And there – Actually, I don't know when it came out, but there is a video that he posted on, I think, Snapchat. It was Snapchat. Hour? That's the that's the one uh-huh. that they said it was 844, the time of the, the Snapchat. It's, it's logged in. It's automatic. The metadata. But then the cops estimate that he, he and Maggie were killed six minutes later. Alex said he was not there. That's the one thing mm-hmm. hopefully the prosecution focuses on because 
that puts him right there minutes from the crime when he claimed he was elsewhere during that time. Right. And to clarify, Alex was in the video. They were like planting a tree or something. Right. And they have corroborate. They have corroborating witnesses like his best friend or one of his good friends uh, and uh, other a couple other people that's verified. Yes, it's him for sure. Guys, we're going to lead in now to a Reddit post. I know Reddit is, is responsible for a lot of the awfulness in the world, but sometimes for things like this nature, um, it can be useful. Now, the person who posted this is called you slash D takes photos, and it's on the R slash Murdoch family murders um, subreddit. And they posted something called Alex fits the family annihilator slash famil- familicide psychological profile to a T. Now, this person's very much interested in the psychological aspects of the case. And I found this post to be absolutely fascinating. So we're going to read it. We're going to take turns reading from it. So I'll start the first paragraph and we'll just switch on and off. Uh, I wish the prosecution would bring in in an expert to testify on the psychological profile of family annihilators because I've always felt like this was a better explanation of Alex Murdoch's motive. This case seems so bizarre because it appears that Alex Murdoch didn't stand to gain much by killing both Maggie and Paul. There was no life insurance on them, etc. Until you look at the psychological profile of a family annihilator. Familicide is defined usually as the killing of a spouse and one or more of the children. Most of the time, the perpetrator will kill themselves after, but in roughly 20 to 35 percent of cases, they do not. That's a lot. According to the book, Jesus Christ. That is a lot. (laughs) That is a lot. (laughs) According Uh, to the book, Familial Hearts, the emotional style of 211 killers, there are two ends to the spectrum of family annihilators, the livid coercive and the civil reputable. However, they all have one trait in common, feeling that they have failed as a man in the traditional societal sense. Okay, so the two of them... Uh, I'm going to read the definitions. Livid coercive, motivated by revenge and rage, controlled issue, control issues that extend to abuse, lead to failure in marriage, loss of children. These make the perpetrator feel humiliated and out of control, which leads to the murders of the family. Civil reputable is defined by motivated by his or her, it's usually his, warped version of altruism, k- views killing his family as, quote, saving them from humiliation, shame, and exposure. And I agree with the poster. They wrote, while I think Alex certainly has control issues and narcissistic traits, he falls inside the civ- in, in the civil reputable category completely. Mm-hmm. I yeah. agree. I agree with that. Okay. So you agree? You want to take the next one? Mm-hmm. All right. I think in... I think in Alex's case, I believe that Maggie was in the dark of the finances. According to her sister, she did not handle the finances whatsoever. And also, according to Blanca, Maggie told her she thought Alex was not being truthful with her about the reality of the boat case. He had just been confronted about the stolen funds, which was one pillar crumbling. And then in three days, she was due to find out about more dire finances in the boat case hearing. With how in the hole Alex was, they were probably going to lose their lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Killing Paul may have been his way of, quote, saving him from the consequences of the boat case, in addition to, quote, saving him from the financial fallout that was inevitable at this point. The boat case was about to blow up, and it's possible that Paul thought his dad would get him off the charges, and Alex knew that wouldn't happen. The murder of Paul may have been to, quote, save him from the reality of what was happening. Uh, And according to research conducted by criminologists in the UK, there are four types of family annihilators. Now it gets deep, guys. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll read the first one. You can get the second one. We'll, we'll trade off. Self-righteous family annihilator. Uh, this sounds like a great like Reddit name. Uh, <laughs> the, this is like a Snapchat name. The killer seeks to locate blame for his crimes upon the mother who he holds Whoa. responsible for the breakdown of the family. It's going to be Howard. <laughs> This may involve the killer phoning his partner before the murder to explain what he is about to do. For these men, their breadwinner status is central their, to their idea of the ideal family. So, again, that's a, like a wiggy. You know, if you listen to our other podcast, guys, this is this is what we're talking about. Yep. 
Disappointed family annihilator. This killer believes his family has let him down or has acted in ways to undermine or destroy his vision of ideal family life. An example may be disappointment that children are not following the tradition traditional religious or cultural customs of the father. Okay. And so there's a little bit of that, I believe. There's he he's gonna overlap in all these, but we all we both agreed he he fits in this one right here. Anomic mm-hmm. family annihilator. In these cases, the family has become firmly linked in the mind of the killer to the economy. The father sees family as the result of his economic success, i.e. trophies, allowing him to display his achievements. However, if the father becomes an economic failure, he sees the family as no longer serving this function. And I'll add to that. There would be even more, obviously, even more staining to the quote unquote achievements if Paul's now a fucking convicted murderer. Mm-hmm. Like yes. DUI, nope. manslaughter. Uh, like Vince yeah. Neil, I, I use the example of Vince Neil who killed the drummer from Hanoi Rocks in 1983, 84. Uh, they were drunk. They were both drunk. Vince got behind the wheel of his Pantera and not only gave permanent brain damage, as far as I know, to the other. Via people in other vehicles, mm-hmm. but killed Razzle, the drummer, and destroyed basically that band from being successful. He paid two point five million in settlements, various settlements, and did like thirty days, and was let go. Mm. So, mm. Um, yeah. this is what that. And there's a lot of bad feeling about this. I mean, he essentially is a man. He's a killer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So Paul would be in this situation. So for a guy like Alex, I can't imagine he would just take that like on the chin and go, eh, well, you know, you know, drinking kids will be kids, that kind of thing. Right. And what it for some reason, what it made me think of is what's the re- the I love this movie and I can't think of the name of it. Ray Liotta, um, Joe Pesci. Oh, good fellas. Yeah, good fellas. Where at the end they take him out because he's Joe, getting Joe out Pesci. of hand. Yeah, Joe Pesci, he's getting out of hand. He's getting wild. He's doing things on his own. He's, you know, he's embarrassing their, quote, family. And I feel like it's kind of similar to that. Like, Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. not only it's, I'm, you know, we're not just talking about Alex's immediate family. We're talking about the whole of murder and the whole of the dynasty, the kingdom, Mm -hmm. you know, and there's this little little situation over here that needs to be dealt with. Oh. Mm-hmm. And we're going to uh, – there's another point to that, that – um, and it's in the episode three, which we'll cover uh, – you know, eventually we'll get to that. But in episode three, there's a call between Alex and Buster. Alex is incarcerated at this point, and he's – all these have been uh, – through the Freedom of Information Act, a lot of the calls have been made public apparently i couldn't find it outside of the documentary i was looking for my own files that i could use independent of it and there's an eerie conversation that i pointed out to you where it's almost as if he's trying to set up buster to go to moselle the place of the murders to set him up to be killed by someone who's waiting for him Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. it wouldn't surprise me if that's exactly what he was trying to do because you get rid of buster now there's one fewer witness or one fewer right. possible, you know, loose mouth. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, maybe save himself in the meantime because he's locked up. It wasn't him. Right. Not understanding that there's too many murders around you, buddy. <laughs> like it's a Christmas. <laughs> right. It's like a horrible Christmas tree with really bad <laughs> ornaments like constantly around you, reminding right. you. Right. Like, exactly. Like when somebody says every all my exes are crazy. Well, what's the common theme between you and all of your exes? Like <laughs> you. Like he think it's like Alex thinks he's Kaiser Soze from you know, the usual suspects. He's just <laughs> off everybody and you're fine. And the last one is called um uh yeah, you want to read that one? Paranoid Family Annihilator. Those mm-hmm. who perceive an external threat to the family. This is often social services or the legal system, which the father fears will side against him and take away the children. Here, the murder is motivated by a twisted desire to protect the family. Mm-hmm. 
Uh, he goes on this this poster. Now, I think that Alex has features from many of these profiles, and it is possible for these to overlap. But I view him more in the anomic category because the finances were crashing down, which did seem to be the main motive. However, we have also heard rumors that Maggie was unhappy in her marriage, suspicious of Alex, and even potentially meeting with a divorce attorney. If this is true, it would serve as another motive for the family annihilator who is deeply triggered by humiliation. Now, there's no proof that she that we have so far that she went to see a divorce lawyer. However, I believe they were living apart at this point. Oh, I didn't put that part together. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So right. what usually precedes divorce? Separation. I mean, in most mm -hmm. uh, in Canada, I know you need a year apart before the divorce can go through, first of all, unless there's like extenuating oh my circumstances. God. Yeah. That is horrible. Um, here in Georgia, it's 30 days. So you 30. file. And yeah. yeah, it's. It's just a 30-day wait, and then they process mm -hmm. it. Wow. So, that's yeah. great. That, that's, that's like mail-order divorce almost. You know? Absolutely. <laughs> it's, it's and I'm like, China. Eh. It's on its way. <laughs> so, um, so, let's, so the next one, you, why don't you read the next, uh, next three? What are the four common areas that cause familiacide? Family relationship breaking down, custody issues with children, financial hardship, and mental illness. Family breakup was identified as the most common cause of familiacide, followed by financial difficulties. Oftentimes, perpetrators struggle with substance abuse as well. Uh, the next paragraph continues. Now, I can't and I think some people can't wrap their head around Alex murdering his wife and son in such a graphic way because he peed to be, appeared to be a person with lots of friends. And people describe him as having a wonderful relationship with Paul and Maggie, except by Paul's own first interview with the cops uh, with the uh, where he said, <laughs> we, you know, Maggie and I, we had, you know, we got We had certain problems, but, you know, they, every marriage, you know, has that. And he said, mm -hmm. what's your relationship with your son? As good as it could possibly be. <laughs> it sounds like as good as it could be. <laughs> that sounds like a shining relationship. You mean under the circumstances? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, it's the, the um, body language guys uh, took apart that video. Did you manage to see that? No, I haven't watched it yet. I haven't had okay. time. You, you, gonna... definitely, yeah. you definitely have to watch that. And then the late, the third interview, I, his three interviews with the SLED team, it sounds like, makes, makes it sound like a <laughs> Santa, Santa mobile unit. <laughs> the, the SLED team um, t or interviewed Alex three times. The third one was just released. And to me, it's the smoking gun. However, um, we're going to go, I'll just go into this a little bit. Uh, another reason people find uh, sorry, uh, uh, my my bad. People describe him as having a wonderful relationship with Paul and Maggie, but according to sociology and criminology, Professor Jack Levin or Levin, the family annihilator profile is a quote middle aged man, a good provider who would appear to neighbors to be a dedicated husband and a devoted father. Mm. Creepy. Another reason people find family annihilators particularly hard to understand or believe is that most family annihilators are not long-term failures who are frustrated by their lack of status or success in life. In fact, 71% were employed and many are highly successful as doctors, lawyers, police, etc. And the last paragraph, guys, I think this case is going to be difficult to get a conviction because with the finances alone, it doesn't make sense. He wasn't really going to benefit from their deaths, but that wasn't really what the murders were about. I think they were about the pseudo altruistic motive of saving Paul from the consequences of his criminal case, saving Maggie from the financial disaster. And I'm suing like social disaster that was going to occur and or punishing her for the perceived humiliation she would cause him if she was truly seeing a divorce attorney and potentially leaving him. I think this hits every point solidly. Mm -hmm. It do, it doesn't it doesn't um, uh, bring it either. But it doesn't bring up Buster because I don't believe Buster is a part of this at all. I don't either, and that is what is so interesting. That is just like the million dollar question. Aside from like where the money go, yeah. What is Buster's role? Is he, you know, where was he just doing his own thing? Was he just such the golden boy that um, there were no issues with him? It's so interesting. Is he Uncle Eckle from uh, The Sopranos, <laughs> the one that they brought over who was, you know, uh, challenged mentally? I, I don't well, know. Uh, 
Buster, Buster, I just had to throw that reference in for Sarah Washington. <laughs> um, she, like, the sense I get is, like, because a lot of people have, like, tried to pin Buster to being the second gun. There's two guns. Like, a guy couldn't pick up one or have two, one on his shoulder and one in his in his hand. I mean, Alex was Very not good. a, he was, he was not a little, little kid. He was actually looked like a pretty beefy, stocky guy, you know, or at least tall, like slanky. Right. Um, it, yeah, it would, be, would have been nothing for him to have two guns on him. Mm-mm. No. And if you're used to having them, I mean, I saw a picture of one of the areas. There was probably 50. I don't know. That might be an exaggeration, but there were I don't know, at least 30. Um, <laughs> so if you are, I mean, that's a lot to me, you know, uh, <laughs> I mean, it was a lot. And uh, if you're that used to them, of course, you they have in there one that like has a strap on it. You could have just strapped it over his shoulder and held the other one. It's not that crazy. It's like he had the Murdoch militia with that kind of firepower. And I understand mm-hmm. people with guns, especially hunting. Hunters, I get having a couple. I don't understand having that many unless you're some kind of spendthrift. And, you know, wow, there's an AR-15 on sale over at wherever. Not Walmart, but somewhere like, I don't know, Gun Depot. I have no idea where people buy guns. I guess gun shows in the in the States. I don't know. I, we have, I think here in Georgia, we've got Bass Pro Shops. Um, Cabela's, maybe Dick's Sporting Goods. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I know. I love uh, that. <laughs> <laughs> listen, listen. I play for I play for the uh, I lay, play for the Red Wings, but I need a little extra something on my stick. Can you help me out? Um, the so the the idea that Buster has to be involved. I uh, they I think they mooted that point right away because they the, he had an alibi. Uh, he's he's not down for this. That's why otherwise, first of all, you wouldn't see him in the peanut gallery giving the finger to one of the uh, the uh, one of the witnesses. Um, we're going to continue with this, guys, with the next episode. We're trying to make these as digestible as possible, keep them about 90 minutes or so, and hope you enjoy them. If you like it more, tell us what you think in the comments. Please, 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 if you enjoy it. Um, and uh, any suggestions for stuff you like covered, not just the Murdoch case, but other stuff of this nature, please let us know. That's what QF2 is for. And um, we love you guys. Any closing thoughts, my dear, before we wrap this up? Um, this is a wild one. And I think by the end of this, my Southern accent is going to get this start coming in more and more. Cause like I can maintain it, but then you know, listening to these people, it's like a family reunion. So by the well, end of it, you not be talking like this. Well, do you, do you have, um, uh, do you, you don't work at, you don't work like your voice is your voice. There's no affectation or do you no, try to keep from. It. Okay, Mm-mm. so but but if you wanted to slip into it, could you? Oh yeah, I could totally slip into it. Like if I was around my family, like if I went to a legit family reunion, um, because they do have that same that same voice, that southern. Um, there's a there's different southern dialects or whatever, and they have the same as these people. Okay, um, so I I could I would start picking it up. I don't know why I don't have it. I really don't. I don't know why I don't have it. Um, but yeah, I would definitely kind of start picking up little words and things, and then it would keep out. There's a Facebook. I guess it. I guess it's called influencer. I suppose. Uh, but she does. She posts reels and stuff. Her name, I believe, is Ophelia. I know her first name is Ophelia, and I think it's Nichols, but I'm not a hundred percent sure. Like N I C H O L S or two L's. I can't remember. But she. Um, the reason why she started posting was she lost her. Um, her her. 19 year old to a a shooting uh he was a shooting Mm. victim and she just used facebook for you know just kind of therapy i suppose and she has them i think she's from i think she's from tennessee Mm. and Mm -hmm. uh, her accent is so goddamn charming that i could go i could fall asleep to it not that she's boring it just sounds Mm -hmm. so relaxing and it doesn't sound obnoxious there are certain accents i know turn people off for me australian accent god bless the australian contingent and the fans but i really (laughs) not a fan of that accent i'm sorry i'm (laughs) the same way that a lot of people turned off by german German people speaking English, you know, it's a little too <laughs> too rough for them. Uh, that's my little peccadillo. But te- te- Texas kind of annoys me when I mm-hmm. hear a really bad drawl. But mm-hmm. the, some of the southern states, I find it very charming. I don't know what it is. 
Right. There's like difference and there there's different types. And some of them are just that like hillbilly kind of yucky Southern. But then there is um, that flowery Blanche Devereaux. You know, for me, that's my family's accent. They have mm-hmm. that because um, my grandmother was from South Georgia, um, mm-hmm. from Oglethorpe, Georgia. And <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, they all have that that accent that's like Blanche Devereaux. And it's very you- flowery and flowy. I think that's the key. The difference being that the Texas drawl is a lot slower. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's almost like, can I give you a ride to the next sentence? This is getting taken too long. And in, in the, in some of the other Southern States, it's more, um, it's, it, there's a, there's a a faster pace to it. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, guys, we hope you've enjoyed this. Um, and we'll catch you on the next one. Thank you so much. Bye.